This might be a good time for everybody to turn off their cell phones. And if you need to keep it on and answer it, you can go out that door there or that door there. We're sending some baskets around. These are H and I. We used to have the H and I can, you know. These are the H and I cans, but they're made out of plastic buckets now. So the money that goes in there, a piece of literature might end up in the hands of somebody in a penitentiary or a treatment center or a hospital that, that uh, uh, we'll find our program through. So if you can give, please give. Um, a little over uh, two and a half years ago, I had the uh, privilege of speaking at a convention in uh, Utah. And uh, while I was there, I met our speaker for tonight, uh, Dale and he was the Sunday night uh, closing speaker, the Sunday closing speaker at that convention. And uh, unfortunately, I couldn't stay that Sunday uh, to, hear, to hear him uh, share. We had to get back, our flights were leaving early that morning. And, uh, but I had uh, one of the girls at that convention send me his, uh, the uh, CD of his message. And uh, you know, while I was there, I, I, I spoke with Dale a few times and uh, uh, you know, my impression of him was he was a really um, honest, uh, down-to-earth type of guy that told it like it was. And, uh, and I saw something in him in, in the little bit of time that I, that I got to know him there in Utah. And I, and I uh, it's sort of like, you know, when I seen him this week when he came in town, it's almost like I've known him my whole life. Like he's been a good friend of mine. And he's that type of person. And, uh, and, and like I said, he, uh, he uh, came down here to share with you tonight his message, his message of uh, hope and recovery, um, his message about H&I, and about his, uh, his time in, uh, in life and in Narcotics Anonymous. And so if you help me, welcome Dale. Cool. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Dale, and I'm an addict. Uh, really happy to be here tonight. Um, I'm kind of overwhelmed. Um, of all the things I do at NA, this is the one thing that I have the most difficult time with. So just bear with me till I get started, please. <laughs> Um, you know, when I got here, there was people that came before me that had forged a path that had given me my new life back to me, teach me how to live. And, uh, you know, I've heard these people's names and and uh, I ran across them and, and the day I ran across John was just a real happy day for me. Because he's one of my predecessors. And then it's so good to see Leah again. And, you know, even though you didn't know me very much, that the work that you have done for Narcotics Anonymous, you know, it helped prepare me for the journey that I have taken in recovery. And it's, such a, it's been such a beautiful thing. Um, so once again, John, thanks for asking me to come here and do this. Um, anybody got a burning desire? <laughs> uh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, and by the way, that tape that John got, that's the only tape I've ever, I've ever made. Uh, I've never had made any tapes before. Uh, I just, it's something about just carrying a message and, and the spirit of anonymity has always appealed to me. You know, when I, when I carry a message to an addict, I, I want it to be face to face. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of tapes that uh, have helped me in my recovery. I don't know why I'm that way, I just am that way. 
In fact, when I was speaking at Utah, my sponsor made me come and do it. I didn't want to, but he made me. So I did it. Um, but I, I want to tell you a little bit about myself, you know, kind of, you know, let you get to know me. Um, my family is from Appalachia, Kentucky, Tennessee, uh, real poor people, just, just down to earth people, uh, real good people. And uh, they migrated up into Ohio in the, in the 30s during the Depression uh, just to live. And my mother just happened to be up in Ohio where I was born. And uh, that's where I'm from. I'm from a little town in Ohio called, called Middletown, right between Dayton and Cincinnati. Um, I never got to live with my parents. When I was about three years old, I, life happened and they couldn't get along, so I, I never lived with them. I, I, was, I was raised by uh, family members and foster homes and and uh, so even even when I was just a little kid, you know, my life was just different from everybody else's. Um, I, I was never in one place very long at all. And even even when I was growing up, I was bounced around, and uh, I went to nine schools in 13 years, and I was always the, the new kid on the block, and I was always different. And I had to act different, and I had to adjust to, to my environment just to survive in it. And I, you know, and I, I don't believe in that cycle babble bullshit about what made me an addict. And that's just that's just the life I led. And um, I done pretty good. I stayed out of trouble. Uh, I finally ended up with an aunt and uncle, and they took they took me in and and uh, cared for me, and it just had nothing but love and kindness growing up. <coughs> but there was just something inside of me that, you know, I, I, was just, I just felt different. I never could explain it. Um, the day after I graduated from high school, I joined the Army. Uh, I, I, that's just, I wanted to get out of the cornfields. I want to go see the world. And so I joined the Army, and they, they told me they'd make a hero out of me, and I said, well, that sounds good to me. And so I volunteered to be a hero. <laughs> I, I can remember when my, my uncles came home from the Second World War. I was born in 1940. And I remember when my uncles came home in 45 and 46, and everybody just made over them so much and treated them so different and, and just smothered them with affection and praise. And, 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 I, and that's what I yearned for all the time I was a kid. I, I wanted to be praised and accepted and be part of something special. But I, I didn't know that I had to go through what they had to go through to get there. And uh, so I, I wanted to be a hero. I wanted to come home in my uniform and my shiny jump boots and everybody just pat me on the back and say, well done and all that. And uh, I, I didn't come home that way. I, I come home busted up on crutches. Um, uh, they, sent me, they sent me some places where I had to do some things that, that really even to this day, bothered me a lot. And I, I had to deal with that. And I did it all in, in secrecy. My family never knew where I was at and what I was doing. And uh, I came home with a bad attitude and a bad habit. And I, 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 I tried to fit back into the real world and, and I, I couldn't do it. Uh, when I was a young boy, when I was 17 years old, I walked into a grocery store in Miltonville, Ohio, and there was a little 14-year-old girl sitting there that was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. And while I was in the service before I left to go overseas, she and I were married. Now, it was 1957 I met her. It was Labor Day, 1957. I met the love of my life. And in spite of everything that's happened to me in my life, we're still together. We've been together for 49 years now. So I, I do know what love is, but you taught me how to, to love. I, 
when I came back to my country and in the way I was in, I, I had lost the ability to love. I had lost the ability to feel. Uh, I tried to function and uh, I was strung out on government dope when I come home. I'd never gotten high before that, never. And I was, I came home on May of 1962 and uh, picked up my wife. I hadn't seen her in two years and we moved to California. My dad lived out there and I found him. When I, when I came home, my friends in the army gave me a bunch of good old government dope. And I brought it home with me. And I ran out about July. And I was strung out real bad. And um, a lot of pain. Very confused. And I had a chance to stay clean. But I didn't. And, I ran into some old boys and we went down to Tijuana, Mexico when I copped. And um, on August the 19th, 1962, on the banks of the Santa Ana River where it goes out in the Pacific Ocean, I'd done my first lick of dope. And, and I, I couldn't stop. It was my secret. It was just something that I did. And even to this day, I don't know why I did it. That's just part of the mystery of life. You know, my, my sponsor tells me, don't ever ask yourself why you're an addict. Just ask yourself, why are you here in NA? That's the only why I got to know. So I, I lived with that terrible secret. I lived in two worlds, in, in the world of having children and trying to be a, a friend and a neighbor and a husband and a, and a, a son. But I had this terrible secret. I was all the time sneaking off and going and getting loaded. And I was so ashamed of myself. So ashamed. Felt so guilty. And I tried to stop so many times. I, I just couldn't. So I started getting trouble out there. Uh, and I embarrassed the hell out of my family. And 1966, uh, a judge out there in Orange County gave me 72 hours to get out of Cal out of his state, uh, or go to a place called Chino for 364 days. Well, I took him up on it, and I got the hell out of California. And I came back to Ohio with my wife. She was pregnant with our third son and two little boys. And uh, I tried to stay clean then. Um, I went from one drug to another. Uh, when I was out there, I got—I was strung out on heroin and uh, amphetamines. And I came back to Ohio, and uh, I detoxed off the off the narcotic, but I stayed with the crank. And um, I don't know why I'm talking about this. I tried to straighten up, but, I, but since 1962 until 1984, I was never able to do that. I substituted one drug for another. I, I haven't touched alcohol since 1963. I was so ashamed of what I was doing and that secret life I was living. You know, I, I didn't want to be a junkie. I didn't want to be a heroin addict that on New Year's Eve 1963, in spite of having a beautiful wife and, and my children, I was so ashamed of myself, I, uh, I got a quart of liquor and went to Huntington Beach and I tried to swim to Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, I didn't make it. <laughs> I sobered up about two miles offshore and realized I was about to fuck up big time. <laughs> Then I, then I thought about them damn sharks. <laughs> that, that changed my mind. I started, I got my ass back. But that's where it took me. Even then, man, I was, I was doing weird shit. I was doing sick stuff. You know? Man, I like never made it. Um, 
I tried to straighten up and I even got a job uh, and uh, but I was eating a lot of speed and I answered an ad in a, in a newspaper and uh, the town I lived in was looking for police officers <laughs> Yeah, I did that. <laughs> did you cop a visual, did you? <laughs> no, I, I, I was one of Ohio's finest for a couple years. And, but I, <laughs> I don't know, I think it's funny too. <laughs> Anyway, they put my old country ass on a potograph. There were some things going on, and they... <laughs> you don't believe it, do you, man? <laughs> and, he, and I finally, I, I lied to him about, you know, having a, getting loaded, you know, using narcotics. And, and uh, I thought I was hip, slick, and cool, but I couldn't beat that potograph, and it, it snitched me out. And, so they, they find you know what are you you know what's what are you lying to us about? And I said, man, I used to shoot some heroin. <laughs> they, they took my gun and badge out on the spot. Man. <laughs> you see, there we go. Everything I tried to do, man. Everything I tried to do that was right and decent, I failed at it. I failed at it. Um, Shit, I couldn't, I couldn't even be a good husband. I couldn't be a good father. I was never home. I was running and gunning, and I was starting to do shit that just wasn't cool. And after, after they kicked me off the police department, why, well, that really embarrassed my family big time. And, and so I said, well, hell, if I can't live with society, I'll just do my thing. So I, I jumped the fence, went out and bought me a Harley, and started using again and I spent many years just being scooter trash. I did everything but get the tattoos. I still don't have any tattoos. There's a reason for that and I, I won't bore you with it. Anyway, everything I tried to do I failed at. Um, and, and the thing that bothers me the most today was I, I drug my family into that. I, I have got just one of the most wonderful women in this world for a wife, loving, caring, good. And why in the hell she stuck with me, I don't know. Maybe good girls like bad boys, I don't know. But I was one bad boy and she was one good girl. Uh, I drug my kids in on it. I never hid nothing from them. I did what I did right in front of them. And I thought I was hip, slick, and cool, you know, doing a deal. You know, and the only thing that is cool about this disease is when your ass is in a refrigerator in a morgue, with the tag on your toe, that's cool right there. That's the kind of cool I understand today. Um, I tried to straighten up a couple of times. In 1980, I got in a bunch of trouble and I put myself in a psych ward and uh, I was in a straight jacket for about, I don't know, three or four days. And they gave me all kinds of titles of paranoid schizophrenic and bipolar and yada, yada, yada. <laughs> they, they even had me strapped down in, in, a, in a bed in the hospital. And that psychiatrist would come in there and, well, good morning, Mr. Spencer. How are you today? <laughs> Do you have something you want to talk about? I said, yeah. Take these straps off my ass, and then you'll have a nice conversation. <laughs> That's where it got me. That's where it got me. I ain't proud of that. The, the thing that... They come from that. When you when you we talk about in our readings about jails, institutions, and death, I, I know what they're talking about. They said medicine, religion, psychiatry. I know what they're talking about. Been there, done that, lost a T-shirt. They put me on psychotropics, and for maybe 
45 minutes out of the whole year, 1980, I could tell you where I was at and what I was doing. I abused Dan just like I did everything else I get my hands on. And it was just as destructive. And funny, my wife took him away from me. And uh, I managed to stay clean for three weeks. And, and I relapsed on Dexatrim. <laughs> 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 within within three days of, of shoplifting three packs of Dexatrim, I was shooting dope again. <laughs> you know, and that's just the nature of this beast. I had to have something in me that made me feel different. I don't know why in the hell I was afraid not to get high. And to this day, I don't know why I was afraid not to get high. Um, the things I had to do to get my wake up. And the thing that bothered me the most in all of my active addiction was the lies, telling the lies. Every damn time my lips moved, I, I, I was lying. I was incapable of doing anything in a good way. The thing that hurt me the most was I'd look into my wife's eyes and just see the shame and the fear. She never, we've never raised our voice to one another. We've never had a fight. Um, I knew when to leave and she did too. But just to look in her eyes was, was all, she, all, all that it took. And to look into my children's eyes, I had three beautiful young boys. And I lived in fear. And it's so many times I could have put all of them in a penitentiary. And that's, that's the life I was living every day. Is this a day that I OD and kill myself? Is this a day that somebody catches up to me and kills my ass because I got it coming? Is this a day that I'm arrested and I'll spend the rest of my life in the penitentiary? These, these are the things I had to think of every day because it was real. That was the life I was living. Running and gunning. Running and gunning. Uh, I was a menace to my, my neighborhood. I was a menace to my community. I was a menace to everybody that, that knew me. I, I destroyed every relationship that I had with any, anybody that I knew. Because I, I would use my shit up and then I would use their shit up. <laughs> Somehow, if I could get my hands on it, it was God. The, um, the people I worked for, I can't believe I, I, I was able to keep a job through all that shit. I even done time in, a, in Alabama. I done six six months in a in the Alabama chain gang back in '72. I managed to keep my job. You ain't lived till you done time in Alabama. <laughs> I was one of them striped ditch monkeys. I don't forget that. But the, the thing I'm leading up to here is. The insanity of the disease of addiction had, had taken everything away from me. I, I was incapable of functioning as a human being, either with or without the drugs. And that's what happened, that the damn stuff quit working on me. It quit working on me. And it, no matter how much I used, it didn't, it didn't stop the pain. It, it didn't stop life like, I, like it used to. Seemed like I always got high just to stop time so I wouldn't be responsible or accountable to anybody. Just hiding in the buzz. And it quit. It stopped working for me. And the people that I worked for was trying to get rid of me, so they set a trap and I fell into it. I got I got busted doing my deal in a in a in a basement up in Lima, Ohio, and they 
they fired my, they fired me, and and what if they come to me the next day and said if I was willing to go into treatment and stay clean for five years, they would get my job back to me. So I went into treatment. So the last time this addict done dope was March the 20th, 1984. I shot me a lick in the parking lot before I went in. And that was it. That was the last time. It was a, I was madder than hell. I didn't want to go. I was so pissed off at everybody because they was sticking their nose in my business, telling me how to live my life and yada, yada, yada. And, but deep down inside, I was so scared and so afraid. I didn't, I, I didn't know what to do. So I went in there and I detoxed. I got out of detox and they put me in a room with a Catholic priest. He, he had a wine and volume problem. <laughs> and then he ran a he ran a uh, monastery there in Covington, Kentucky. And something, I walked in. The nurse introduced me to him, and I said he was laying there in bed, and he had had his priest shorts and priest T-shirt on. It was olive drab, and and he was reading books about Vietnam. And that's the last damn thing I wanted to see or hear. A priest going to tell me all about Vietnam. And a and nurse introduced me to me. And I'm just going to tell you where I was at. How sick I had become. She introduced me to that priest. And he stuck his hand out. And said, I, I'm glad to meet you. And I said, I just grabbed his hand. And I squeezed it real hard. I said, I'll tell you something, Father. I mean, you're going to make a deal. It says, uh, you're not going to mention the word God, and I ain't going to jerk your face off and wipe your ass with it. <laughs> That's where I was at. That's right. I didn't want no dog. No, don't you bring no God around me. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to see it. I don't even want to talk about it. That's how sick I was. That's how hurt I was. And deep down inside, more than anything else, I wanted to be loved, and I wanted to be trusted, and I wanted to be forgiven. It just consumed me. I didn't know what to do or how to do it. A week later, I made up my mind I was getting out of that. <laughs> when, I, when I went into the treatment center, I... I had enough dope to last me about three weeks in a 380 pistol. And they found it in my clothes. <laughs> and they told me if I left, the, left that treatment, it means I brought drugs and a weapon into it, that they would press charges against me, felony charges, and prosecute me. But I was so sick and so screwed up that I tried to leave. And something happened to me in that in that treatment center tonight. And I don't talk about this too many, too often. That's, tonight I want to talk about it. I remember getting my clothes on and I went over to the window. And when I was going to the window, I bumped that priest's bed. And he reached over and turned the light on. And he saw that I was dressed and, and at the window. He reached over on his nightstand and picked up this rosary. And got down on his knees and that floor started praying in Latin. And uh, I went to the window and I, I stuck my one leg through the window and I started to go out and something grabbed me and pulled me back. And I said, I'm going to mess this guy up. And I turned around and he was still on his knees on the floor praying. I tried to go out the window again. And something pulled me back. I was starting to get scared. Uh, uh, one more time, I, I hit it. I tried to get through the window, and something pulled me back and just pushed me down on the floor and sit on me, and I couldn't get up. Now, I don't know what that was. Today it was a God shot. Because I knew if I left that, that, that room that night, 
my life would be worthless forevermore. I was going to leave my wife, my kids, and everything. Go back to California, get loaded. I laid there on that floor and something was just sitting on top of me. It's a heavy weight. And I cried and I fought. I tried to get up and I couldn't. Finally, I just went to sleep. I woke up the next morning, it was about 10 o'clock, and I was laying in the middle of the floor with my clothes on, and the priest was gone. He, he checked out that morning about 8 o'clock. And he told the nurses not to come in here and bother me, to leave me alone. I would come out when I was ready. I don't know what to make of that. But when I was laying there on that floor, I knew if I ever got loaded again, I was going to die. I knew it. It was in here, and it was in here. So I finished the program, and I came home, and I stayed clean. I stopped using. But that's the only thing I stopped. I was staying clean but living dirty. I had a lot of other bad habits that I wasn't ready to let go of. And they was causing me just as much pain in my life as a dope, but I didn't know it. So, I stayed that way for about six months and I was fixing to just get myself in a whole lot of trouble. Clean. I wasn't around no program. I wasn't around any other addicts who were, who were clean. But I was still committing felonies and doing stuff. An old buddy of mine who I fronted a whole bunch of stuff to, uh, disappeared with the stuff, and I was trying to find him. You ask yourself, what the hell's this got to do with H and I? Well, I'm leading up to it. <laughs> and I know none of you guys ever took a front and ran off with it. Uh, I, I never did. <laughs> but. I finally went to find him, and, and his wife told me, man, he's in a treatment center in this town over here, and he's got your stuff with him. He wouldn't leave it here with me because he didn't trust me. So I went over there, and my pistol in my pocket. And I, that's, that was the life I led. I led a very violent life. Violent life. And uh, guns and violence was part of what, what I did. So I walked into this, this treatment center and, and it told the people that I was his uh, cousin and I needed to talk to him, so they let me in. And so I went up to his room and he was real surprised to see me. <laughs> well, anyway, you know, he, Addis has got the best bullshit alarm in the world and they could, you know, just read body language and knew shit was coming down. And, and so he, he got real nervous, and I done made up my mind. I, I was going to tag his ass because that was my re-up money, and I was ready to do the deal again. I was ready to do the deal. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't live clean. I didn't know how to. Anyway, one of the boys that was in the room, he went out and got a nurse and said, something's going on in there. He said, Murphy's fixing to get hurt. He's dead now, so I'm buying his anonymity. Anyway, the nurse came in and said, there's a meeting down at the end of the hall. All of you get out of this room right now and get, get down there right now. You too. She pointed at me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hell, I wasn't leaving. I was going to tag his ass. You know, you know, you can't let people slide. Once they find out you're a punk, everybody takes advantage of you. So you, you had to do the deal. You boys from New York know what I'm talking about, don't you? 
There's a lot of you here too, guys. Amazing. Anyway, um, I went down into the hall and, and into this room, and there was this big red-headed guy in there. Now, last time I seen this guy, he rode with a bunch of old boys, and I rode with a bunch of old boys. And every time we got around each other, we'd have a friendly pissing contest, and we'd try to kill each other. And the last time I saw him, that's what we was doing. We was trying to kill each other. Yes. I thought I was back in Plaiku City when that went down. I remember looking at him and him firing his pistol at me, and I was firing my pistol back at him, and why we didn't kill each other that minute, I don't know. And I said, oh man, I am so glad I'm in a hospital. He makes about three of me, and he's a real serious old boy. And he took a look at me, and he walked up to me. And I carried my 380 back here in my pocket with my handkerchief around it, and I reached in there and grabbed my 380. I cocked it. I was standing in the middle of that treatment center room with a cocked pistol in my hand, and this, this guy walks up to me, reaches out, gives me a hug, and says, welcome home, brother, the war's over. I got my first Narcotics Anonymous hug by a, an addict doing H&I in a treatment center where I came to destroy my life and somebody else's, and I'd done it with a fucking gun in my hand. Got shot. Another God shot. Now these God shots are tripping me out by now. I'm not used to that good stuff. And it was real neat. I, I said, Hayes, what's going on here? He says, then he gave me my first DNA message. It's the best one I've ever got. And it's one I still use today. He told me to sit down, shut the fuck up, and do what I tell you. <laughs> and that still works for me today, fam. Still works for me. So I sit down and he says, now when I tell you to, I want you to read this. And he gave me, why are we here? <laughs> And I was still had my eye on Murphy and everybody else, and I was watching Andy make sure he was just he wasn't sitting me up to kick my ass here in front of everybody. And he, and they started reading, they're doing this NA program in there, and I wasn't paying attention. And finally, he said, "Dale, read that. Why are we here?" And I started reading that, and it was just my gosh, I, I couldn't believe those beautiful words. It was me. Everything that I had been doing all them years, it was there on that, why are we here? I couldn't get through it. I couldn't get through it. I got choked up and handed it to the guy next to me and said, you read it. And I, that was my first Narcotics Anonymous meeting. It was a first step meeting. That's where I got my message. I didn't, I didn't come there looking for a message. I was, I was wanting my money. <laughs> <laughs> but God gave me something else. He gave me you that night. He gave me you. Man. After it was over, I said, Hey, you got any more meetings like this around here? And he said, Well, we're starting one tomorrow night. How would you like to come? I said, man, I'd love to be there. And he told me where it was. And I showed up. And I, I did the next thing that even to this day is the most powerful thing I've ever done in my recovery. I reached out and let another addict put a white key tag in my hand and welcome me home. That was it. That was the beginning of this beautiful life that you that you have prepared for me. That was the beginning of the end of all that misery and fear, hate, resentments, anger. All that shit I lived in all them years. A little 18 year old Jewish boy gave me my first message. 
Today I'm his sponsor. He's got more clean time than me, but I'm his sponsor. After that meeting, Hayes came over and he said, how much clean time you got, Dale? And I figured up something, I got nine months. He says, good, you're eligible for H&I. <laughs> <laughs> that next Wednesday night, I was in that treatment center, not as a threat to society and the rest of the world. I went in there, and he gave, he, he gave me the little handbook the do's and the don'ts, and he says, and I don't do a damn thing unless I tell you to. <laughs> and I, I'd done my first H&I meeting as, as a member of, of Narcotics Anonymous H&I subcommittee. That was the first time I ever give anything back. That was the first time I given anything back. And, I, and, and I'd done it a week in, 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 in this fellowship. This was the beginning of this beautiful journey that you have prepared for me. My predecessors who went before me, they created this beautiful program and, and sacrificed themselves and brought this program into our lives. I can't begin to say thank you enough. You know, I, I didn't know nothing when I got here, but you did. And you were taught just like you were teaching me. You were giving me what had been given you through our service structure and our traditions. And I began my journey through these beautiful steps. So the steps changed my life. And one of the things that I learned early on was I could not run from these steps. I wanted to live. I wanted to come home to my beautiful wife. I wanted that love back. I, I wanted that trust back. And I looked at these steps and I knew that I could get these things. I wanted to be forgiven. And I was forgiven the day I walked into that door, that first meeting. You forgive me. You didn't give a shit what I had to do to get here. You didn't care who I hurt, what I did. You didn't care about all them felonies and, and deviant sexual behavior and all that shit, all the lies. He said, come in, have a seat. Let us show you how to live. All you have to do is follow directions. Have a relationship with these steps. Have a relationship with our traditions. Become a member of Narcotics Anonymous. Surrender to the spiritual values that this program is trying to give us. Accept them in our lives without hesitation or without question. And that's what you did. You gave me these beautiful, beautiful gifts. I was incapable of being honest. I was incapable of having faith. Hell, I never had no discipline in my life. I never had any courage. The only time I had any courage was when I had a damn gun in my hand. But I ran from everything else. We went to play uh, some baseball games, and <laughs> we, uh, we played some boys down in Cincinnati. They kicked our ass, but we had a all sitting on a bench at the park, and old Hayes comes up and says, boys, we want to start an area. He said, you're the chairperson, you're the secretary, you're the treasurer. And you looked at me and said, you're the H&I chair, Dale. <laughs> what Andy didn't know, I was still, I was still acting out no behavior. I was staying clean and being a member of NA, but I, I had a lot of habits that I just hadn't quite let go of yet. And I, I, was, I was still peddling dope. And so I, I tried, we put the committee together, and then finally after about, about our first or second meeting, I, I realized I could not go on like that anymore. And so I got rid of all my stuff, and I went in and told on myself. I told my home group what I'd been doing. And uh, 
So he was glad that the program was working in my life. They didn't, they didn't kick me off the, as a chairperson that like to ask, and I just behave yourself and follow directions. And that's what I did. <laughs> so one of the first things I had to do, the little town where I used to be a cop, <laughs> <laughs> I had to go to the chief of police who used to be my sergeant and tell him we'd like to start an H and I beating in his jail. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was funny too. Man. And for the next five years, I carried a message into that middle town jail where I used to throw people in there lock them up that's what i had to do and i did it every every friday night i would go down to that bullpen with a basic text and a handful of literature and say all right boys if you're sick and tired of this shit let me introduce you to narcotics anonymous we got a lot of members in our fellowship today that come out of that jail because this addict made that commitment to carry our message I was told when I got here that you ever to ask why I'm an addict. The only thing I had to know was God made me an addict just so I could find him in Narcotics Anonymous, find him in these beautiful steps, and then go to work for him in our traditions. And that's what this addict's been doing ever since he's been here. I've never not done H&I. We, we formed a region, and I became the first H&I chair of the Ohio region. And the first six months of my tenure as H&I chair, they opened up 14 new penitentiaries in the state of Ohio. And... We got together as a region in the areas, and we had Narcotics Anonymous meetings in every one of them penitentiaries. Through public information work with the, with the criminal Department of Corrections and the Lieutenant Governor, and they welcomed us with open arms. They were glad to have us. And so we, we done the deal. A lot of participation, a lot of activity, we was kicking it, doing what God has asked us to do, carry our, carry our message, that fifth tradition. So I, there was this one penitentiary, it's called Lucasville. That's where our maximum security is. And uh, we was doing a meeting in there. And uh, I went in one night <clears throat> to do the regular meeting, and it's, it was a three hour drive from my house. I had to drive clear across the state of Ohio. But I did that. That's, that's what I did. And a uh, substance abuse coordinator of that penitentiary, that facility, he said, uh, so Dylan, I got, a, I got a special request for you tonight. I wanted to, I want you to do something special for me. I said, well, what is it, Joe? He says, I got a group of addicts back here in the back that they want to talk to you. And I said, what about this meeting here? He says, oh, that, them boys will take care of it. And so he took me back into the bowels of that penitentiary and I, I thought something was up and he strip searched my ass. <laughs> they had to strip search to even go in there. And they took me in this room and it was about the half the size of this room and it had 25 chairs bolted to the floor with plexiglass cages at each one with a guard in them. And uh, we come in and sit down, and he nodded to the guard. He opened the door, <clears throat> and here come 22 inmates. Now, these inmates were shackled. They had their flip-flops on, their orange jumpsuits, their waist bracelets, and ankle bracelets, and they come in, and, and I recognized them from all the notoriety that they had created in our in our state there. These were death row inmates. And 
it was awful hard for me to sit there and not be judgmental of these human beings. Because right off the bat, I thought about their victims and the destructive force that they had created, the harm that they had done to society and to other people. I asked God to help me to look at them as just recovering drug addicts. And he helped me. They wanted to start a Narcotics Anonymous meeting there. And they wanted me to teach them about their traditions so they could maintain that group and its integrity without fighting amongst themselves so they could keep that group alive. They wanted to do something worthwhile with what life they had left. Just like me. Because that's what this recovery has been to me. Wanting to do, make my life worthwhile for what life I have left. For the next two years, that's what I did. Every other week, I drove there and taught them the traditions how to hold your meeting. That was another God shot for this addict. I told my sponsor what I was doing, and I had to do this all in the spiritual spirit of anonymity. We couldn't let that be public. Now, this is only the second time I've ever talked about that. But that changed my life forever. They're no better than us, no, no worse than us. Yeah. <clears throat> One of the things that they did they always lit a candle and put it in a, in a chair in the center. Daddy, who died that night. And while I was doing this, several of them paid their dues. And my sponsor told me when I told him what I was doing there, he says, in your mind, Dale, says, you, you write your name on the back of one of them chairs. Because when you pick up Jocko, your ass could be sitting in one of them just like that. I got it. I got it. So that's why H and I has been so wonderful to me. I've been given gifts like that. I can't I can't judge anybody that comes into this into our rooms. I will not judge you. I will welcome you with open arms. I know even in here tonight there's a lot of a lot of addicts sitting in this right now that are very new to recovery. Make them welcome. You who are new here, you are our future. You're, you're our lifeblood. We're going to give you a message of hope and freedom from active addiction. You put it to work in your life and then you help carry that message. You help save other addicts' lives out there. You do the things that God wants us to do. Now this this is this is a this is this is the cost of being a member of NA. If you want to call it, it's a gift to me. To help another addict stay clean, find a new way to live, integrate them back into society where they're acceptable, responsible, productive members of society instead of being the pain in the ass we used to be. I still carry the message in, in penitentiaries and jails. Ever since I've been a member of Narcotics Anonymous, I've been on the H and I committee. I've been on the Public Information Committee. And I've always been a phone line volunteer. Anything I can do to help an addict find our rooms and our message, I'm willing to do it. There's, I cannot believe I'm still alive today. I cannot believe that I'm free today. But most of all, I can't believe that 
I've been given that, what I've always dreamed of having. That's being loved, trusted, and forgiven. And that's what these steps and you people have given me. You've given me a whole new life back. Hell, me and my wife's been on a honeymoon for 20, 22 years. <laughs> the first year was rough. <laughs> the, only, the only warm, fuzzy thing I got to sleep with was a cat named Rocky. <laughs> We, we put it back together. We're doing fine today. The, I've had I've had such a wonderful time on this journey. Been given so many beautiful gifts, and uh, getting to come down here and, and get to, to meet you guys has just been real special. It, it it takes a lot to get me off that mountain. But, but when one of my, my heroes, my predecessors, asked me to come and help carry this beautiful message, I'll do whatever you ask me to do, whenever you ask me to do it, however you ask me to do it. I do not say no to Narcotics Anonymous. And I never have, and I never, I ain't gonna start now. This, this has been a, a beautiful year for me because I started, I started using drugs in 1962 and I got clean in 1984. For 22 years this addict suffered. And ever since I picked up that white key tag, my life has changed. And here on March the 21st of this year, I was allowed to have 22 years clean. I'm free. I'm free. I made it. I've been clean longer than I shot dope. It's fucking great. I love it. <laughs> I'm urging each and every one of you love this fellowship enough to do something for it. Do something for it. Don't, don't, you don't have to carry the message. Be the message. Be the message. I've seen everybody just bust their ass and just working and having fun, preparing this beautiful celebration we're having here tonight. I, I got off just watching everybody have fun. A few of you stressed out a little bit, but yeah, you'll be you'll be okay tomorrow. <laughs> but I've looked at each and every one of your faces, and I'll not forget it. And that's what I've been doing ever since I've been a member of NA. I've looked at a lot, a lot of faces, given a lot, a lot of hugs, and gotten a lot in return. But there's a lot of faces aren't here anymore. And I asked him, you know, let's, let's reach out to them newcomers. Don't, don't give them your phone number. You get theirs. Give them them rides to meetings. Help them out. Let them know that we'll love you until you're able to love yourself. Because they're just like me. They want to be loved. They want to be trusted and they want to be forgiven. And this program is the only way that's going to happen for them because it's the only way that it happened for me. And thank you all for letting me share tonight. <laughs>